All right, well, uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where in the world you happen to be. My name is Christopher Harrison. This is Web Wednesday, the show where I bring on people that are much smarter than me to talk about cool web dev topics. Now, if you're anything like me, and I know I am, uh, you probably debug way too frequently with like console log and, and print and, and things like that. And, and what if I told you? What if I told you that it turns out that there's a better way to actually manage all of this, that you could, I don't know, use some better tooling and be able to walk into your code and see what variable values are and 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 start doing, you know, a lot of other things beyond just simply printing out here, here, got to here, this didn't work things like that. And so fortunately, we have Leslie Richardson that's going to be joining us from the Visual Studio team to highlight some of the cool things that the Visual Studio debugger can do for you and to help hopefully start to get you away from that print console log type thing that we all do into using a better tool for the uh, for the job. So Leslie, thanks again for, for joining. It's It's fantastic to have you here. Happy to be here. So I always like to start off every stream with the, the question of how did you become Leslie Richardson? Like, how did you get into, um, uh, into the space? How did you get to be uh, where you are? Yeah, so I joined Microsoft straight out of college. I went to University of Florida. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so since then, I've been at Microsoft for three years. All of those years have been spent on the Visual Studio team. Uh, I spent the first two and a half years on debugger specifically. And these days, I've been working on extensibility experiences in Visual Studio, too. Mm -hmm. So uh, yeah, I, I do remember when I found out first that I was going to be on the debugger team, I was like, all right, I guess, because like yourself, Christopher, you're not alone. Um, I Print statements were like my best friend. I put print statements all over my code whenever I was debugging in school and stuff. And I was never really formally taught how to use a debugger. And, you know, sometimes just for flair, I might add a great point here and there, <laughs> but that was about it. <laughs> so the fact that I was coming onto this team and being expected to... Uh, you know, work on it, be an expert on the subject and share that info with others. I was like, uh, all right, you know, uh, <laughs> sure. Why not? <laughs> Think until you make it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so and ever since I, I have since fallen in love with the debugger, it really saves a lot of time if you really take the time to explore it and get to know it. And sooner or later, I mean, you might have to break up with your print statements a little bit because there's better <laughs> tools you could be using. I don't know. It's, it's that, that, that's going to be hard. Like it, I'm, I'm, I'm pretty well committed to those to those console log statements. So mm -hmm. it's I was it's... too. <laughs> Still am at times. Not going to lie. <laughs> so what's the what's the like what's the number one thing that you would tell somebody who uh, really is doing pretty much all of their debugging with console log that the actual debugging tool can do for them that's going to make their life easier? Like what's the top thing? Yeah, so, you know, with console log, it, you know, it can get the job done, but a lot of the time it can pollute your code, right? If you're like myself, I would usually forget to delete all the console log statements that I've put all over the place afterward. And, you know, especially if you go to share that code with a teammate or a friend or whoever's working on that project with you, it's, it's kind of a lot and you kind of want to keep your code clean. And with debugging tools, not only is it cleaner because a lot of the time you're not modifying your code in order to diagnose issues with it, but there's just a, a lot of different alternatives that can allow you to uh, diagnose those issues faster and more efficiently. Specifically, there are ways to use to be able to use a print statement in a way that doesn't even require you to restart your debugging session if you're using them right too. Mm. So like, um, yeah, it's just overall faster and efficient and more efficient a lot of the time once you get to know those other tools. I, I just want to say that I feel personally attacked when, when you mention you're forgetting those print and, and console log statements in, in, in code that you then ship. No worries. I have totally been there. <laughs> like it's just it's too much work. It's two in the morning. You're debugging this really annoying issue. And 
the time, like, I don't want to have to hit the forward slash twice to comment it out or remove it. Like, it's... <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Exactly. I, I also I, I loved something else that, that you pointed out, um, which is that ability to be able to like print something out um, without having to recompile or restart your code. I think that's a really big thing because I know a lot of times when I'm trying to do that that console log, it I, I then just get stuck in the cycle of like, okay, fine, let me add in two or three more of these. Let me stop my application. Let me go ahead and restart it. And then I'm now walking through the eight steps that I have to, to, to do <laughs> yeah. to then get back to that specific spot. <laughs> yep, exactly. <laughs> Definitely not fun. I mean, the amount of time you probably spend just stopping and starting your application uh, when you're debugging is probably a lot. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's actually a great point right there. Yeah, that I'm probably just losing a lot of time just doing that. <laughs> mm -hmm. I'm sure that adds up very quickly. <laughs> Cool. All right. So what does the Visual Studio debugger then, I, I guess, sort of like look like? I guess maybe that's that's a good place to, to, to start. Okay. I, I can kind of give you like a overview since there's a lot. Yeah. Let's, let's do that. Hidden and not hidden. Yeah. Okay. Cool. So you can see my screen, right? Yep. Cool. So welcome to Visual Studio. Oh, um, uh, I think you might have the wrong <laughs> screen shared out because I'm, I'm seeing your browser uh -oh. window. Oh, that's awkward. <laughs> cool. Let me change. Okay. Let's. The screen. Um. Doo -doo -doo. Oh, I was sharing my entire screen because I'm. Ah. Need to okay. So. Let's try it again. No worries. Cool. All right. And can you see that? Yep, I can see that. Give me one second, then to get that set up into here. Um, everybody can talk amongst yourselves. <laughs> I will give you a topic. The Industrial Revolution was neither industrial nor a revolution. Discuss. <laughs> and cool. All right. There we go. That looks better. Made it? Yep. Awesome. Cool. So, uh, yeah. Welcome to Visual Studio. Uh, Basically, I'm, I've already hit a break point, so we're in debug mode right now. And I think what's interesting about the Visual Studio debugger and is something that I know the team we've been, we've been trying to work on for a long time now is just making a lot of those cool tools more discoverable. So while there's a lot that's present at first glance, there's also a lot of tools that I'm probably going to show off later that are hidden away behind some context menu or something else that can be hard to find. <laughs> so, <laughs> so that's the downside to the debugger. But once you do discover them, they're really useful. So to give a general tour, you've got your stepping icons here. So you got step into, step over, step out. You have your inspection windows, which I use a lot to inspect all of your related uh, variables and stuff like that. Okay. And of course, you have your breakpoints, you have your execution pointer, which you can actually drag and move around, which I can show off definitely. And so I guess to give an example of a hidden tool that I use a lot is, um, so just for context, I have this .NET Core application here. It's a web app. It I like to read, so um, it will give me a list of books that I can choose to read and add to a shelf or choose to reject, and they won't be added to my shelf. And I have this breakpoint that's set up at uh, one of my early constructor methods. Uh, called book manager. And let's say I wanted to navigate to the bottom of this function just to see that all of these books get loaded into uh, this neutral books array properly. So usually this might be the time where I might have to start spamming the step over button or F10 in order to get down there. And that's not going to be fun because I got this for loop that's coming up here and I could be stuck in that for loop for who knows how long. So <laughs> an alternative that I use all the time is this feature called run to click. So you'll notice this green glyph icon that appears when I hover over a line. So if I click that, then it should take me. Uh, yeah, so it just, it fast forwards my code's execution all the way up to that point. It's like having a fast forward button on a remote control. I dig it. And, and, and that then solves that problem that we were talking about earlier about like now I have to walk through, you know, eight things that now I can just go, right. go here, <laughs> do this. Exactly. Exactly. And <laughs> it's really the little things. I use that one a lot. So um, there's features like that. 
Uh, one of my other features that I enjoy, so we've got a data tip here. So a lot of the time you can hover over a variable and view all the related variable information or all of its contents and things like that. And in my case, I pinned one already. So pretend you don't see this right now. I'm gonna show you something cool. Usually when you open up a collection or um, an iron numerable or um, an item like that, right? You might try to inspect that particular array and you'll just get the generic type information. That's not very useful, right? So if you wanted to know the, if you would like to quickly identify each of these books in this case by uh, its title property, for instance, all you have to do is navigate to which property you want to view first and then pin it. I call this pinnable properties and it will be bubbled up to the top of your list. And then as you can see, if I hover over again, it's a lot more useful information right at first glance instead of having to expand each of these out until you find the right one. And this is applicable to all of the different inspection windows that the debugger has. So I can expand this one out and see the same results. I can pin multiple properties and identify that way. So it's a really nice way to do it because uh, an alternative that was used before this tool was just, I mean, you could modify your two string method for a, a particular class. But if you do that, that could impact your program itself. If you want to keep the separation between what's being displayed in your debugging environment versus what's being displayed in your program proper, you may not want to override your two string method with that debugging related info. So <laughs> that, yeah. So that was the uh, one thing that came about. And then the evolution of overriding the two string method turned into another attribute called debugger display, which I have commented out here, but this was a tool where you could append something like this to the top of your class definition, and it would let you do the same thing that those pins did, which um, let you view those specific properties um, in the debugging environment. Okay. And Yeah. And you know, the problem with something like that, though, is that IntelliCode's not really going to tell you that this exists, or actually, I believe it, I think some refactorings do tell you that nowadays, which is cool. But if you're not actively seeking this out, it can be really hard to find. You still have to modify your code in order to use that. And you don't want to modify our code to debug things, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, and that's where the pin properties came from. So pin properties, it actually came from hearing customer sentiment. So I, I'd been doing tips and tricks debugging talks for a bit. And a lot of people would ask about debugger display, which is always a hit at these talks like, wow, <laughs> is this new to Visual Studio 2019? Like, no, apparently this thing has existed since like, I don't know, 2013 or l earlier than that. <laughs> really? So, Yes, I'm, I, I'm literally I'm, I'm, I'm now learning this for the first time right now. Like I had no idea that that attribute was there. Like I've, I've done that two string in, in the past and it's like it didn't quite it, it didn't feel good, um, but at least it worked. <laughs> right. So, <laughs> it's a workaround. It's like, uh, yeah, I don't feel that great about it, but it gets the job done, you know. So <laughs> this one uh, with pinnable properties, you can feel good about what you're doing, knowing that it's not going to impact your program proper and still get the same result, so. <laughs> I like it. Okay, let's, you know, one thing that I would love to do, especially for somebody who's kind of new to the debugger, is I would love to spend just a couple of minutes on on the basics. Um, yeah. So uh, the, the step, um, so I, I'm going to, I'm going to make one real quick assumption and actually, you know what? I'm not going to, I shouldn't do this. Let's start here. Let me ask this very basic question. Um, and then we can sort of branch out. What's a breakpoint? Okay. Yeah. So a breakpoint, it's this little red icon here that we started at the beginning. Basically what it lets you do is you can pick a line of code that you would like to inspect first. So, and, and then from there, if you hit, run or F5 or whatever the equivalent is on whatever ID that you're using, breakpoints are pretty equivalent across most of the major ones, then your code will stop its execution at that given point. And then from there, you can choose to go line by line and inspect whatever you want, or you can choose to stay at that line and use whatever tools that you want in order to try to identify your problem. 
So um, let me refresh and I can go ahead and hit that break point that I had set there again. But that's sort of the, the gist of it. Okay, that makes sense. Yeah, so it's like a stop. It's telling your code, stop at this given point and let the user decide where they want to go from there. Right. Let, let me go take a look then at, at what the current state is. Let me explore a little bit. Mm -hmm. Oh, that's fun. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta love errors. <laughs> Absolutely. Give that one yep. more second. So, yeah. yeah. There we go. I have and... hope. I have hope too. That's a good sign. That didn't happen before the pop up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but what's uh, great about breakpoints is that once you get the basics down, there's so many different kinds of breakpoints that you can use to take it a step further. Like if you wanted to stop under a given condition, then you can do that, which is pretty sweet. Chugga, chugga, chugga. Here we go. There we go. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Slow and steady. <laughs> yeah. So you know that your breakpoint has been hit. And, and a lot of IDs, you'll get like a little arrow like this. It might be kind of hard to see, but there's this yellow execution arrow here. And this is the arrow that is letting you know which line is about to be executed next. And so as I mentioned from here, I my code is completely stopped. It's not doing anything besides existing at this given line. So if I wanted to continue, then I have a couple options. So the first one I can use is the step over tool. And step over just lets me go to the next line that's about to be executed. So in this case, it's the stream reader uh, block here. And then from there, I can choose to step over again and go inside here. Uh, there are cases where you may want to step inside another method. And if you do that, then you can use step into. That's probably not gonna work here because I have a setting that uh, allows me to just ignore code that's not mine, <laughs> essentially <laughs> turned on. So <laughs> don't really care about that. But oh, I believe get base string for image is one that I own. So if I stepped into that, then it should take me to that method. Okay. So that's step into. And then let's say I can step into there and I could do this all day. It could go on forever depending on what your code is doing. But if I wanted to step out of this method and return back to that line, then that's where step out can come into play and it will return me back to that line I was previously at. Okay. So that's kind of the basics. Yeah. So having setting brace basic breakpoints, you can set more than one if you want. You can have 50 if you want. <laughs> and uh, also the beauty about Visual Studio is that you can keep track of all your breakpoints in the breakpoints window down here. So if you do want to get breakpoint happy, just know that it's pretty easy to discover and deal with them as you want, <laughs> as you will. And uh, also the perk about using multiple breakpoints, if that's something you want to do, in addition to something like run to click, is you can set a breakpoint, let's say at the end of this function, and then we'll hit continue. And it should take me to that next breakpoint. It'll go ahead and run everything else from that previous line that I was at up to that point. Okay. And so that's that's a lot like that that run to cursor only this time it's instead yeah. going to um it's instead going to to the next breakpoint. Yep. Yeah, personally I like to use run to click if I don't intend to use another break a specific breakpoint for a very long time like if I want it to just be a one time thing then I'll use run to click, but if I intend to make a jump like this a lot of times then I might as well just set a breakpoint, but sure call. Okay. Whatever floats your boat. This this is such a great question that I want to make sure that I get it in, even though it it flow wise doesn't necessarily fit. But it's a great mm -hmm. question. Um, so um, Sunny over on Learn TV asked the question: um, Can we do remote debugging by attaching to code on a remote server? So they know that you can do that with like local IIS and attaching to the W three um, P dot um, exe service. But can you do that on a remote system? Yes, you can. I am not super familiar with it, but we have the attached to process window that you can go to under debug and hopefully that loads up. Don't know why my computer's being so slow today. 
But um, it should give me a, a dialogue of different processes that I can choose to attach to. And uh, since then, over time, we've added different connection types that you can do. So first you have remote as an option. I don't have any remote processes running right now, but you can use that option. If you have a Docker container, you can oh, connect wow. to one of those, uh, Linux or Windows. That's a that's a really new addition that we did. Um, you can connect via SSH or a WebSocket, JavaScript, TypeScript. So there's a lot of different options of processes to attach to, and then you can debug like you normally would. Okay, awesome, cool, cool, cool. All right, um, so let's let's go back then to to, to that debugger. Um, and one of the other things that I notice on on your screen is you've got that little you've got a blue pin over on the left side, and then your books are sort of like hanging out there, um, kind of doing mm -hmm. book things. Um, what what's going on there? Yeah, so this is a data tip, and that was that thing that I was doing where I was hovering over a variable and you'll notice this drop down that uh, that comes up. So this could be this is a really quick way of identifying what the value of a particular variable is while you're debugging your code. So let's see hover over something that's done. So like if I hovered over neutral books, for instance, it's filled up, I can expand it out and um, see everything that's being stored in that list. And the pin here represents a data tip that I decided to pin. Because one of the annoyances that comes with data tips is once you hover off of it, it'll disappear. So if you want to keep it around for a bit longer, then you can hover over, get the data tip, and then pin it. And you can drag it wherever. And this data tip will exist for as long as you decide to keep it there. So if you chose to quit out to exit your debugging session, it'll still be there and uh, it'll only disappear when you choose to delete it. Okay, all right. And then I really dig that that you can just mouse over whatever it is and then it will just pop up and, and allow you mm -hmm. to start digging into um, into different parts of it. Are there any cool things that you can do? Because um, I, I know like you showed off the um, that ability to pin a property so that way I can see that. Are there any other like cool things that I can do with that? Or is it really more about being able to go in and just like see values and inspect it? Uh, really, that's more of an inspection tool and it's supposed to make inspection quicker. But there are some things that you can use alongside those pins. So we have multiple pins here. One of the things you can do is uh, if you wanted to, let's see, yeah, if you wanted to show the property names, for instance, then you can choose to display those or not. And also my personal favorite is if you only care about like whichever properties that you pinned, you don't care about this long list of properties, then you can just filter out all of the properties that aren't pinned. So this can save you some time too if you're just interested in inspecting a particular property or two. And uh, personally, I like to use this alongside the search tool in my locals, autos, and watch windows. All these are great inspection tools for examining your variables. And uh, one of the quirks that comes with searching for variables in your windows like this is that we had to, <laughs> we basically had to create a stopping point for how deep is this search going to navigate and, uh, in order to find whatever keyword you're looking for. Because otherwise, depending on what crazy variable you created or what crazy tree you created, it could go on forever. <laughs> we don't want that. So that's why we have this search depth stopper here. And with search depth, you're kind of trading up a larger depth for performance over performance. So if you make it higher, it's going to search more thoroughly. But uh, at the cost of it's going to take a longer time to find results. But if you and then the opposite is obviously the case, too. So usually you can set your search depth lower when you filter your properties out like this because there's less things for uh, Visual Studio to search, <laughs> which can which I know we're all about performance. So if you want to save some performance time and you like to search through your variables, definitely consider pinning properties that you care about and searching for them that way. So okay. the author or something like that. Is that is yeah. it just searching um, property and uh, like variable names or can I also search values when I'm doing that? Uh, yeah, you can search for values as well. Let me think of a book that was in here. 
Again, this is the beauty of pin properties. I can just like look at <laughs> look at this. <laughs> All right, so let's say I'm looking for visible. Ah. So, there you go. Mm -hmm. And uh, also, it'll give me the results that are in the expanded version as well. The search depth is within range. Okay. So yeah, it can search for values. It can search for type, I believe too. So I said string. Oh, I said sting. <laughs> <laughs> not the not the singer. <laughs> so yeah, you can search for type, value, and name. That's cool. I dig that. Okay. Now you also highlighted the watch window and the autos window. What do those yeah. do? Yep. So these are all very similar. Uh, so we have the, the easiest one to explain is the locals window. I think the locals window will give you all of the variables that are within the scope of where you are currently at. So my, I've hit this breakpoint that's at the end of this function. So it's giving me the relevant, uh, some of the relevant uh, variables that are at that given point. We have the watch window, which lets you type in what specific, whatever specific variables that you want to look at. So maybe the locals window might be too busy for you, depending on how much you have going on in your program. So uh, I said, I wanted to see neutral books. Oh. Neutral, neutral books. There we go. And uh, I could get similar results that way. And again, I can inspect my variables the same way in both, in all three of these windows, but the watch window lets me choose which variables I care about the most. And then Otto's window is <laughs> honestly really hard to describe. It's, <laughs> I think it's really just an instance of an inspection window that will take the variables that are within the last three and the first three lines of where your execution pointer is at <laughs> that given point of time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So, so I'm guessing based on that, you don't find yourself using the autos window all that frequently. I don't personally. Yeah. I usually use locals a lot and I use watch. And what's cool about the watch window, especially other than just being able to pick what um, is getting displayed specifically is that you can use these things called format specifiers, which let you get uh, a little more nuance in how one of these variables is going to get displayed in the watch window. So for instance, let's say I want to get uh, neutral books, whatever the first book in there is. Oh, it's not going to get up. Well, let's see. Let's pick, I'm trying to pick a good example. You know what? Uh, I'm blanking on a good example to you. No, that's <laughs> fine. No worries. Right no worries. That's yeah, fine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. But uh, yeah, format specifiers, they're really cool. Uh, there's actually an example up here. It's just not in range right now. But no, there's this comma in Q thing. And NQ stands for no quotes in this stamp, in this case. So if I had a string variable where I didn't want to see the quotes, the quotation marks around it for whatever reason, I could just use comma no quotes and then it would show the value without the quotation marks. And other things you could have like an int value and maybe you want to display it as a hex number and not as a decimal number, then you can use comma H. So little things like that. And the beauty about it is you can use comma. So if you're not familiar with those format specifiers, which again, these are not very discoverable at first glance, then you can do comma and it'll give you a list of different ones that you can use. So there's decimal energy, integer, there's the hexadecimal integer, no quotes, as I mentioned. Uh, yeah, lots of different ones and they change and vary depending on the language that you're using. So if you're writing something in C++, then the different format specifiers you get uh, will be unique to C++ and stuff like that. Okay. All right. Cool. So what other things do I need to know um, about this debugger? Like I've, I've asked you like everything that I've, I've seen so far. So what, like, what haven't I asked or what else do you really love to show off in here? Yeah. Uh, so there's 
as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of different kinds of breakpoints that you can use, and including one for the console.log print fans out there, there's an alternative breakpoint you can use called a trace point. So let me set a breakpoint elsewhere. Now let's just set it here for now. And uh, with trace points, they essentially allow you to write a print statement without having to modify your code. So when this breakpoint gets triggered or when your code stops at that particular breakpoint, it's automatically going to send out whatever uh, print statement that you specify. So again, it's like you get the print statements that you know and love without having to <laughs> modify your code or uh, potentially even have to stop and start your application to see it in action. Okay. Let that connect there. It should. <laughs> it, <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, it's going system so performance <laughs> is, is inversely proportional to the number of people watching. <laughs> <laughs> I believe that. I like to think uh, things like this can be incredibly demo shy too, so like, well, give me a minute. Maybe I'll get there. And I, I think it had something to do with my get shelved books or add all to shelf method. So if I set a breakpoint here, I'm just going to go through the motion. Um, all right. So when you have a breakpoint, you can set a breakpoint as usual. You can hover over it and you'll notice this settings icon here. So if you click that, then you get a couple different options. So the first is conditions, and this will allow you to set what I mentioned earlier, which is a conditional breakpoint, and that will allow you to stop your code only under a given circumstance. So if you wanted your breakpoint to hit when uh, I, in this case, in this for loop is equal to like 29, instead of having to constantly step until you've <laughs> reached 29, starting from I equals zero, then you can do that. In this case, we want to go to actions, and this will create a trace point. So from here, you're being prompted to uh, show a message in the output window. And from there, I can say, I, I want to see where I stops personally. So let's say index colon curly bracket I. Oh, OK. Mm -hmm. So when I do that, uh, the breakpoint changes from a circle to a diamond in this case. I can also add a conditional breakpoint to this if I wanted to as well. And that would add a plus sign in that diamond as well. But we're going to keep it simple for now. Still chugging. All right, so let's hit continue again. And in my case, I actually told, actually specified for this particular trace point to not stop my code when that trace point is triggered. So this is an option that you can do. So you don't even have to stop if you don't want to. If you just want the program to run and then you'll inspect everything later, oh, okay. you can do that. Mm -hmm. So in this case, I, I hit continue. And one of my favorite windows that I, in the past, I found myself closing out a lot of the time, as I'm sure a lot of people <laughs> do, is the diagnostics tools window. And this is a window that displays a lot. There's kind of a lot going on. There's a lot of good profiling uh, tools that you can use specifically when it, in relation to CPU and memory. But what I'm most interested in is this bottom part here, and that's uh, specifically the events tab. So this is a really cool tab because uh, it can give me logged information about a lot of different things, including breakpoint information, program output, exceptions, uh, all, all of that. So Whenever this breakpoint chooses to trigger, we might have to restart, unfortunately, in this case. But just know, <laughs> just know that usually when you're using a trace point, a lot of the time you do not have to start, have to stop your application. Okay. So. Okay. Um, there is a question from Timebender um, who asks about. I, he, he asks, um, can you visualize a custom collection as a grid while debugging in .NET 6? Oh, good question. Can you visualize as a grid? So currently, 
I don't think you can unless you create your own. So you can create your own visualizers. And I think there are people who have made visualizers that will allow you to do that. I know that was something on our on the team's radar for a while, and I'm not sure what the progress is on it, but you are not the first person to ask that <laughs> question about being able to view <laughs> your matrices and other uh, 2D, 3D items like that in a better uh, visual manner. I, I, I could see that in that way. Maybe I could go and like sort columns and things like that to be able to better see mm -hmm. what's inside of there. That makes sense. Okay. Yeah. All right. Gosh, I'm so sorry. It's taking forever to load. No, it, hey, this 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 is this happens. This is like this is a real programming. Every every right? single person has, has been there. <laughs> Welcome. Yes. Need to throw a couple of console logs into IIS Express and see why it's not uh, launching correctly. Yeah, pretty much. Oh, yeah. I don't know. There's it, 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 there's something fitting about about having a bug uh, occur while while doing a debugging right? session. Right. While debugging. Very meta. <laughs> Always enjoyable. Yes. <laughs> Jeez, <please. laughs> Yeah. So um, I'm trying to think of other things that I can talk about while trying to troubleshoot these issues because it's so much cooler to show them, in my opinion. But uh, let's see. Uh, yeah, I was mentioning that diagnostics tools window, and um, it's great because, again, it gives you logged information in a space that's not the very busy output window as well. Like sometimes you might print out information, like, you know, if you're using a print statement, it's going to show up somewhere in that output window. And a lot of the time for me in Visual Studio, at least, I have to scroll around until I locate the, uh, the print statement, when, which is hidden amongst a bunch of other lines that I don't care about. So with the diagnostics, diagnostics tools window, you can easily filter out just your trace points, AKA your print statements in this case. In order to <laughs> okay. <laughs> see them all in one place. <laughs> now, I, you know, while, while it's still like doing its thing in, in, in the background, um, everything that you've shown so far is all of this available on the community edition of Visual Studio, which for anybody who doesn't mm -hmm. already know, the community edition is, is the free edition of, uh, well, I, actually, I think I should take that back. Um, it's, it's free in specific instances. Uh, yeah, all all of these tools are that I've mentioned are free in the community okay. version. Really, the only ones that aren't are ones that I haven't demoed <laughs> yet, and even <laughs> then, it's very minuscule. If you have uh, enterprise specifically, uh, yeah, if you have enterprise specifically, there is a tool that you can use called IntelliTrace, and that will allow you to take like a snapshot of your application state at the given point in time that you're interested in. And from there, you can actually rewind time and go to that location and inspect your variables and anything else that you want to identify in the same way that you would in the present. It's just uh, at that particular given moment in time. So it's really good for if you get an exception thrown and you want to go back to that moment in time where that exception occurred in order to try to piece together where the origin was then you can use uh, IntelliTrace to do that. Okay. All right. But everything else then is available with the, uh, uh, is, is available with the community edition. Yep. Okay. Correct. All right. Um, and on that, uh, that, that profiler that you were showing off, that's also in, in the community mm -hmm. edition. Is that part of um, the, like the Visual Studio debugging sweet or do you sort of consider that as something that's that's um that's ancillary to it uh by ancillary do you mean just like it's integral to i know as in uh it's uh, as in it it's it's like it's secondary to it it's 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 not necessarily directly associated with it Oh, okay. I'd, I'd say it's part of the suite. So okay. in the debugging space, we're part of a larger umbrella. It's just like Visual Studio Diagnostics, and that consists of um, the debugger space and then the profiling space and then production diagnostics, which deals with um, debugging your code while it's in production. So, uh, or while it's currently shipped and out in the world and people are using it and oh no, some, you just got a bug <laughs> <laughs> type deal. So yeah, profiling has its own little world that 
is really cool to learn. You know, I think there's that mindset where uh, who cares about profiling until the moment you experience a performance issue <laughs> <laughs> while your code is up and running. You're like, oh, darn it. Now I have to quickly figure out the uh, tools. So yeah, uh, definitely check out some of those profiling tools that can really help you pinpoint where your CPU usage issues are coming from or your memory problems are coming from or just uh, garbage al allocation, things like that. Oh, okay. And so then that could also like track down um, like garbage collection cycles if you're doing like, you know, C sharp or something like that. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yep, exactly. Cool. Yep. So C sharp specifically, and I think that was one of the newest tools that uh, the team added. Um, yeah, because garbage allocation, you know, usually you don't have to worry about it because it's C sharp and it happens automatically, but there might be cases where actually you do care. <laughs> so having a tool like that is absolutely and the debugging tools that you've shown um do they work for all languages that are supported in visual studio so i could do this with python i could do this with um with with c sharp obviously which you've been demoing um but could i also do this with like javascript and typescript and python Ooh, okay so for yeah, C sharp and the .NET suite yes of course that, that works c++ a lot of these tools uh, a lot of these same tools work with slight exceptions. So um, there's actually a tool called the data breakpoint that works differently in C++ than it does in um, C Sharp, but otherwise it's pretty much the same. For Python, JavaScript, and TypeScript, there are definitely a lot of limitations. I'd say for the, the basic um, inspection tools and debugging tools, so like your breakpoints and uh, your stepping tools, your inspection windows, Jeez, oh, <laughs> uh, all of those, <laughs> all of those should work for TypeScript, Python, and JavaScript. But uh, yeah, the debugger it's it's more C plus plus C sharp friendly in the context of Visual Studio, not VS Code. Okay, okay. Now uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask this question, but I want to make sure uh, because it, it was bubbled up, and, and and I think it's it's a good one to to, to ask. Um, but I want to make sure that I caveat all of this by highlighting the fact that Leslie is not on the Visual Studio Code team; she's on the Visual Studio team. Um, yes. So um, um, uh, Devin at one uh, asks the question. Uh, for all of these that you've shown off, is all of this available in VS Code or are there certain things that are not available in, in VS Code? Yeah, uh, most of the stuff is not available in VS Code to my knowledge, unless somebody, meaning like an extender, added it. <laughs> okay. I think the closest that we got is there is a, the C++ debugger extension is one that the debugger team owns specifically, so a lot, of tools that are contained within that extension uh, are pretty parallel to what exists in VS. But yeah, most of these tools, unfortunately, do not exist in VS Code, at least not in the same way. OK, so but the, the core stuff does. Like, I can still set breakpoints and do that step out and step into. But some of those like neater things that you were showing off, like being able to pin things and 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 like the, the cool little um, attributes and so forth, like those might not be supported. Right. OK. OK. Um, Unix dev asked the question, what's the best way to deal with debugging code that was compiled with the optimizer turned on? Um, is there an indicator to show when a line of code has been optimized um, out and can a breakpoint not be set? Ooh, OK, so good question. There is the just my code setting that mm. exists, and uh, this is a uh, this is a tool that you know what, I give up. <laughs> so, <laughs> just my code that is a setting that, when turned on, will allow you to only step through code that is yours. So, not framework code, um, none of that, just the code that you've written. So, if you would like to step through that framework code and anything else like that, that usually gets optimized out when you have that, then you can turn on just my, then you can turn off just my code. So that might be a good way to start. So uh, if you're interested as to where to go to do that, I should just be able to type that in and it should show up. See, this is what I get for um, updating 
<laughs> Visual Studio right before my demo. <laughs> We have all been there. All of us yep. have been there. <laughs> Don't do it. If you ever have to present, do not update your ID or whatever you're presenting in until after the fact, because it will bite you in the butt. <laughs> I had that. I, I had that happen once. Um, there, there, I, I had like updated. Um, I was about to do a bot framework um, talk at, at Build, and I had updated a tool, and all of a sudden. It um, it was not then opening um, anymore. Like it would launch, I would see the icon, but the window wouldn't appear anywhere on um, on my desktop, and could not for the life of me find it. Wow! And I, I was literally like 15 minutes before I was about to present, and so what I wound up doing was just logging into into Azure. Sp- Spinning up a VM on Azure and then reinstalling <laughs> the tool on there, a real quick Git clone to pull my code down and then doing the presentation. Amazingly, it all worked. <laughs> Zero out of 10, though, would not recommend. <laughs> no, I can't imagine that's fun. <laughs> yeah. So we're going to try the alternative of because I work on the Visual Studio team, I have five different versions of Visual Studio installed <laughs> on my computer. So keeping the hope alive with the preview version, which I haven't updated in a while. So let's see how effective this one works. But fire away your questions <laughs> regardless. If it works, I'll be able to actually show them off in person. Or the good news is I also have a resource link that contains lots of information for a lot of what I'm just talking about uh, right now. Which actually reminds show. me, I don't know why I don't have that handy let me go grab Uh-oh. that real quick um do 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 i can um, share it with you real yeah, quick go for I it mean, if you've got a handy uh yeah it's aka.ms slash i think vs debugger yep okay wait no oh. that's not it I lied. <laughs> I'm gonna remember. <laughs> um, do, do, do. Oh, VS debugging. Debugging. There we go. Of there we go. Okay. <laughs> Sweet. Cool. All right. Perfect. 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 And then where are we here? All right. Cool. Yeah. So that link is like your end all be all to anything that I was meant to <laughs> <laughs> be demonstrating it live but uh it contains the the code to this particular project if you want to play around with the specific bugs that i deliberately put in there and it also contains links to a bunch of blog posts and related docs for all the different debugging tools that i could think of and just compile them all on the list okay cool and eventually is it i I've, um it looks like it's doing something there <laughs> Yeah, you know, baby steps <laughs> could be working. Oh. <laughs> oh, I've got to love it when oh. this happens. Like, you know, the most that's happened to me as far as like demo pitfalls, pratfalls go was in an internal conference. I had forgotten to reset all of my intentional bugs. So like I started running the program being like, there's so many problems that we're going to diagnose together. And it's like, this thing is working totally perfectly. <laughs> It's like the one time you actually want to see bugs. It's just like, why are they happening? And then I was basically just like, okay, everyone close your eyes while I reset one bug because it's really cool, I promise. I love the irony oh. there of, of <laughs> right? you know, yeah, you're trying to, 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 to have things fail and then it works. <laughs> yep, exactly. <laughs> oh, that's funny. Yep. All right. It's supposed to be about debugging. It's the one space where you actually want to see bugs. <laughs> All right. It's loading. Yeah, that's Anything a good different sign. is good. Yeah. <laughs> so am I your first guess where it's just the demos are completely shy and just don't know this yeah no this no this 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 does it it, i mean again it's 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 live it's it's live coding it uh yeah this absolutely does happen yep that's the fun of it um cool well let me let me ask you this while while hopefully that all that'll come up um in um um in in the background 
is yeah the the junior mm-hmm. automation says this is the best part about uh, live coding yeah that's very much the way that um, uh, that that all goes um, operation is taking longer than expected we know <laughs> <laughs> Like, thank you. Got that. Oh, that's funny. All right. Um, so, so you mentioned the ability to be able to like add in your own console log um, um, type of, of behavior, not have to um, do that uh, constant refresh of, of code. What are the other big reasons that mm-hmm. you would give to somebody to go, hey, you really should be using a debugger for this rather than that old style way of doing, um, you know, console write line and things like that? Yeah, so we already talked about one, you may not want to modify your code if you can avoid it. (laughs) Just keeps your code cleaner (laughs) and just only with the necessary pieces. And other times there's just specific circumstances where, yeah, you may not want to use that print statement. For example, when you want to debug something that's within a for loop or a while loop or something like that, you may not necessarily want to uh, step through every uh, iteration of that loop that could take forever. If you're just trying to find out what the second to last instance of the for loop before it decides to crash is, um, that's not a fun thing to do to have to spam (laughs) step over. And then, you know, you're watching Netflix at the same time and whoops, you skipped it. Now you have to start all over. (laughs) So that's when you can use something like a conditional breakpoint, which lets you immediately fast forward to that particular moment that you want, that you're interested in, instead of having to step through a bunch of unnecessary lines of code that you didn't, need, yeah. didn't care about. I, I I appreciate though that real world example of watching Netflix in the background while <laughs> while coding. Right. <laughs> it's like, gosh, this is gonna take forever. Yep. <laughs> exactly. Other instances you have there. Uh, I've experienced cases a lot of the time when I code where there's a variable or a class or just some property that's being changed while my code is running that was not meant to change. And the problem with it is, well, because you weren't expecting it, a lot of the time, I don't know where that change is coming from. And like, how am I going to piece this together? And then that means kind of having to play the trial and error game. And that's really when uh, I'm pulling out all the stops on the print statements typically and putting print statements in every method, hoping one of them is going to fire and figuring out how to narrow it down. So an alternative to that is uh, there's this breakpoint called a data breakpoint, and it'll let you set a breakpoint on a particular property. And that breakpoint will stop your code's execution when that property changes at all. So it could mean being Mm -hmm. incremented or decremented, or it could be reassigned a new value. If any of those happen, then your breakpoint, your code will stop and it will redirect you to the exact line of code where that change is coming from. So that's like a really quick way of solving that problem instead of having to play the fun trial and error game, which could last you a good couple of hours if you're not careful. Uh, <laughs> I, I dig that. So being able to track down those those types of, of accidental state change bugs, although all the React mm-hmm. developers are going, see, this is this is why we just do everything stateless. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> and you know, it's, re- it's really good if you are like new to a team or you just inherited some new code that you're unfamiliar with. And then when something like that happens, you really don't know where to start because you're just now learning the code base. And so you can use something like that in order to track it down faster, especially if you don't even know where to start with your trial and error process. Right, right. Yeah. Um, so tech Ben asked the question, this is um, this isn't necessarily um, directly related to the debugger, although I'm going to sort of add on one um, to this, um, is the mm-hmm. question, you know, do you run unit tests to test your service and controllers before running the app? And the answer should always be yes, that you should run you should run unit tests. But let me ask you this follow up question is, um, can you debug your unit test as well with the with the debugger? Ooh, OK, so. I'm not super familiar with the testing side of the debugging space, but my good pal and colleague Kendra Havens would probably be the one okay. to ask about that. She's she's like the testing expert when it comes to unit tests in Visual Studio. Okay. So yeah, I don't want to say anything that's 
incorrect. <laughs> <laughs> but, <laughs> but if you ping Kendra Havens or Got Heap on Twitter, she'll probably know. God, he, that that is a fantastic Twitter handle. I know it's so good. I'm so mad. I like my my Twitter handle is so generic. I, I tried to do something cooler, but all of my ideas were taken. I'm like, all right, well. <laughs> <laughs> um, Code with Sean, um, by the way, um, who who I trust, he's um, um, he's a common streamer. Um, does mention that uh, you can run the debugging tools on on unit tests, but still go mm-hmm. find um, Got Heap. Um, if for no other reason, then again, that's it's such a fantastic uh, such a fantastic uh, uh, Twitter handle. So oh, and yeah. Code with Sean is is uh, is an MVP as well. So should make sure to to highlight uh, uh, highlight that that fact as well. Cool. Cool. All right. Well, um, Leslie, um, and by the way, if you haven't already noticed, uh, Leslie's Twitter handle is right up above her head, um, so you can uh, you can go find her there. Thank you so much for for coming on and showing off the the debugger. Um, I definitely learned a lot. Like like I said um, um, earlier, is that I've I've used the debugger um, periodically, but used it in the past, and I I really appreciated sort of being able to see. Hey, look, there's actually some cool things that you can do with this that are beyond just doing that print and doing that uh, that console log. So I greatly appreciated you uh, kind of giving us that that tour and showing off some of the neat things that you can do inside of uh, Visual Studio. Absolutely. And yeah, I highly encourage everyone to go check out the link that we shared. So that's aka.ms slash VS Debugging, uh, especially because I didn't get to show off <laughs> as much of the awesomeness as I would have liked to. So if you are interested in learning more, I've compiled a giant list of all the tools that you should definitely be checking out or at least experimenting with and uh, give it a try. Perfect. All right, Leslie, thank you so much. And to everybody who tuned in, thank you so much for tuning in to uh, Web Wednesday. We're here every week, Wednesday, 3 p.m. Pacific, um, doing um, all sorts of different uh, web dev things uh, with uh, really smart people. So um, hope to see you back next week. Leslie, again, thank you so very much. And everybody, you know, enjoy the rest of your Wednesday or Thursday, depending on, on where in the world you happen to be. Bye-bye.